Hi folks, welcome to the third tutorial on Z80 assembly language for the ZX Spectrum. If you've been following this up to this point, then you know that our task is to produce a version of Connect 4, the classic board game. So at this point, you should have your board drawn. The instructions for that were in the second tutorial. Now, the one thing I failed to do was give you very specific instructions about where to place your board. So chances are your board isn't exactly where my board is. And if we want our code to match up, then I'm going to suggest you tweak your code slightly so that the first cell in your board, the one on the top left, appears at row number 10, column number 12. In other words, uh, your def B instruction preceding the string for the board should be def B 22, 10, 12. And the rest follows suit. I've done something a little bit sneaky here and I'm going to let you in on it before we, before we really get rolling with this tutorial. I have done a hidden row directly above the board. In other words, at position uh, 9, 12. There's a row of counters with paper white and ink white so that they're invisible. Now you might wonder why the heck would you want to do that? Well, it struck me that if I want my counter to move left and right when I press certain keys, I could do that by moving an actual UDG graphic around. But since I know I'm going to be simply moving a color attribute when the counter descends through the grid, I might as well just move a color attribute to move it left and right and we'll keep everything exactly the same. So in other words, when I want the counter to appear above the board, all I have to do is simply display it with ink red instead of ink white and it will appear. So, um, before we move on, I suggest you adjust your code to put that extra line in uh, that shows a row of counters invisible to the naked eye directly above your board seven counters directly above your board. So our first task then is to make a red counter appear in the center. And then after that, we're going to allow the user to press the O and P keys to move the counter left and right. And we also need to put some validation in to make sure that the counter can't be moved off the edge. So it always stops at the very left hand cell or the right hand cell. So first of all, let's get the counter displayed. Now we can't just say display the player's counter at column number 15. Because we know that that position is going to change throughout the game, we need to set up a variable to store that information or the equivalent of a variable in assembly language and the way we do that is we use a particular memory address and we simply put this information down at the bottom of our listing around the area that we did our UDGs. I'm going to label a memory address PPOS short for player position then def B then 15. So that will be the start position for my player, the 15th column. Def B, by the way, doesn't take up any memory. Um, it's just an, an assembler directive in the same way that org is, is an assembler directive. All it does is it, it tells the assembler that this piece of information called 15 isn't an opcode, isn't an assembly language instruction and cannot ever be executed as such. It's just a piece of data. So at memory address ppause is 15. Now I'm going to think ahead a little bit here and I'm going to do comma zero right after it. I don't actually need to do that, but it was a convenience for me and I'll explain why it's there a little bit later. Now, because I know in thinking ahead, I know I'm not always going to be using 
a red counter. So I don't want to just automatically, you know, choose red. I need, I need to have the color as an actual variable because I know that information is going to change as I play the game. So I'm going to define another variable called P call player color. Def B 58 and 10. Now I've placed two pieces of information here because first of all 58 is ink red paper white. That's what that means in terms of how attributes are displayed. 10 is red ink blue paper. So in other words, I need two pieces of information because when I'm showing the player at the very top before the player has placed his counter, I need it to be 58. I need it to be that attribute. But when the counter is descending through the grid, I need it to be 10 because I still want the blue of the grid to show up behind the counter as it descends. So that's why I'm, I'm using, I'm setting up two colors for the counter. Later on, when we move the yellow counter, that's going to be 62, which is ink yellow paper white, and 14, which is ink yellow paper blue, but that comes later, right? For now, we just set the initial values to 58 and 10. Okay, so far so good. So those variables, they're not really variables, they're just pieces of data sitting in memory addresses, but they can be accessed by referring to the memory locations p pause and p call. When those locations are actually sitting in memory, uh, sorry, when that data is actually sitting in memory, the assembler really sees p pause as something like 50,025 or 50,030. The beauty about it is we don't have to work out exactly what memory address p pause refers to. We let the assembler take care of that. So we will only ever need to say p pause when we're programming in assembly language. All right, so back up to the main program then. You've displayed your grid. Underneath that then you want to display the player. Okay, there are a number of ways to show the player on the screen. So I'm going to describe how I've done it using this little routine. First of all, I'm loading the address 22816 into the register HL. 22816 refers to the first column in the ninth row. That's the particular attribute for that location. Now, why am I doing that? Why am I not just going directly to the center? Well, that will make sense in a moment. I'm now going to load the value in the address P position into the BC register, which is currently set at 15, right? And then I'm going to add the two of them together using add HL comma BC. Now, I'm going to explain why I did def B 15 comma zero for P pause. This played havoc with me originally and uh, I couldn't figure out where I was going wrong when I left that zero out. Here's the thing I need, here's the thing I forgot about. I'm adding two 16-bit registers together. So when I loaded P pause into BC originally, it grabbed the 15 and then it grabbed the next memory address because remember 16-bit uh, requires two memory locations. So it grabbed the 15 and then it grabbed the 58. So I got completely the wrong calculation. So as a convenience, I did 15 comma zero. In other words, 15 followed by a blank memory location that I'm not using for anything, but it has to be there because I'm loading it into a 16 bit register. <laughs> it took me a while to figure that one out. Okay, so I'm add adding those two values together. What does that get me? That gets me the correct location in other words, I'm going 15 squares to the right, which puts me bang in the center of the board, directly above the board. So now uh, BC is added to HL and the result is stored in HL. So it will be 22816 plus 15. 
Then I'm going to load the color of the current player into the accumulator, LDA, brackets P call. That will load red into the accumulator. And then I'm going to change the actual memory location indicated by the new value of HL with the red color. So that should mean that the counter will appear as red with a white background in the desired position. A little bit complicated, but I hope you can follow the steps that, that led to that. So that will show the current player on the screen. The next thing is we want to invite input from the player. I'm going to use the keys O and P for left and right. Let's do right first of all. There's a very useful system variable stored in the Spectrum's memory at location 23560 and it's commonly referred to as last K and that means the last key to be pressed on the keyboard. In other words, whenever you press a key, memory location 23560 is automatically updated with the ASCII value of that key press. All right. Now we can refer to memory location 23560 all over the place if we need to, but it's very helpful if we put an assembler directive at the start of the program, just underneath org 50,000, that says last K EQU 23560. And what that means is you want the label last K to refer to memory location 23560, to equate to memory location 23560. It means you don't have to commit that to memory. You can simply refer to that as last K throughout the script, okay? I did use EQU before, uh, but I didn't explain it. Remember when we were showing strings, uh, we always ended it with like EO string EQU dollar sign, something to that effect. Um, all that really does is label a memory location but store nothing in it. It's kind of a, a little bit of a cheat in that it doesn't take up a byte because EQU is an assembler directive. It doesn't actually take up space, but it allows us just to label a memory location without wasting it, if that makes any sense. Um, here's how we receive user input. First of all, let's load last K into register HL. Now remember, we're not actually loading the ASCII value into register HL, we're loading the memory location last K into HL. Now we want to put what's in HL into the accumulator, and we do that with LDA comma brackets HL. Now here's a new instruction that you haven't seen before, CP112. 112 is the ASCII value for a lowercase p, right? And CP stands for compare. What this does is it compares 112 with whatever is stored in the accumulator. In other words, if the last key that was pressed happened to be a lowercase p, then the accumulator is now going to have 112 already in it. So CP112 means compare 112 with 112. And how this works is, if the two values are identical, it sets the zero flag. Okay, now I've got to pause a little for a little moment and explain what I mean by the zero flag. You have used the zero flag before, but I didn't refer to it as a flag. Remember we used the instruction DJNZ, which was decrement jump if not zero. If what was not zero? If the zero flag was not set, that's what that actually means. The zero flag is in the processor and it either has the value zero or one. When it's zero, we say it's not set or it's reset. And when it's one, we say that it's set. So in other words, when a calculation has a zero result, the zero flag becomes set. 
and when a calculation has a result other than zero, the zero flag is reset. In other words, it goes back to zero again. So the CP instruction has the effect of comparing the two values, the accumulator and whatever's after CP. If they're identical, it sets the zero flag. So now when I do the next instruction, which is JRZ comma P right, um, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here because P right doesn't currently mean anything, but JRZ means jump relative if zero, right? There's also the instruction JPZ, which I haven't used. JPZ and JRZ, they, they do essentially the same thing, but JRZ doesn't take as much memory up. It only uses one byte, whereas JPZ uh, uses an extra byte. Jump relative means jump roughly 127 bytes forward or backwards in the program listing, uh, whereas JP means jump to a specific memory location, which could be anywhere across the 48K. So it takes more memory to store that memory location than it does to take the number of bytes you want to jump forward or backwards in the listing. Um, so I'm using JR because I know I'm not going to jump very far. Again, whether you use JP or JR, it's seamless in terms of your programming. You just have to state the place you want to jump to. The assembler will work out the number of bytes it has to jump. You don't have to worry about that. So P write, short for player write, is a little routine that I'm going to write in a moment, but I haven't written it just yet, okay? <laughs> so I want to jump to somewhere that will actually move the player to the right, okay? if that makes any sense. But leave it for now. Just pretend that we're going to write that later, and we are. So if the zero flag was set, it will execute that. Now we need another instruction for moving left. So we do CP111, which is the ASCII code for a lowercase letter O. And again, we do JRZ, but this time it's JRZ comma P left. And we're going to write another routine that allows the player to move to the left, okay? Now, right after that, what I want to do, well, I want to jump back to displaying the counter again, because bear in mind, uh, possibly nothing was sitting in last key. No key maybe was pressed or a different key was pressed. So at this point, what we need to do is simply jump back to displaying the counter and keep on inviting input from the player in a continuous loop that is ongoing. So I'm going to do JR P loop, player loop in other words, and I'm going to label player loop. I'm going to start that at the memory, memory location where the player is first shown directly above. Okay, so there we go. With me so far, and it is getting a little bit complicated, I do realize. It takes a while for it to sink in and it took me a while to, uh, to get this working. So let's create the routine P right directly below this for the player moving to the right. So the first problem that I anticipate is if I move the player one square to the right, that's fine, that will work. But I have to remember that I have to undraw the player from the location on the screen that the counter is currently sitting in. So I'm going to do LDHL comma 22816 again, and I'm going to load BC with the player position. Now remember we've done this, this is a direct copy of what you saw at the beginning of PLOOP. We're going to add the two values together, HL and BC, and we're going to load 63 into the memory location of HL. In other words, we're going to return it to ink, white, paper, white. There we go. Now we want to move the player one square to the right. So I'm going to load the player position into the accumulator. And then going to increase the accumulator by one. And then I'm going to load the accumulator back into the player position. Okay. And that is essentially the end of it 
except we haven't included anything for stopping the player from veering off the edge of the grid. So I'm going to do a little bit of validation at the start of this because if I do it at the end of it, it's a little bit too late. You've already moved. So the very first thing I want to do in P right is load the player position into the accumulator, compare it with 18. Column number 18 is the rightmost column of the screen that you want the player to be able to place the counter in. In other words, 19 is a step too far. 18 is the last one. So if those values cancel each other out, if 18 in the accumulator is the same as 18, then jump back to P loop. In other words, don't do anything else, just go back to displaying the player on the screen. And that little piece of validation right there, those three lines, that will prevent the player from going too far to the right. Now, the routine for moving the player to the left is almost identical, you just have to tweak this one a little bit. So if you want to copy and paste P right into another section called P left and do a couple of small tweaks, the uh, second line CP18 should change to CP12, 12 being the leftmost column of the grid. In other words, 11 would be a step too far. So 12 is the edge of where you want the player to be able to move. And instead of increasing the value of A further on down, you're going to decrease it with deck A because you want to move the player one square to the left. Now both of these routines, at the end of them, we could just jump straight back to P-loop. But before I do that, I want to add one instruction to the end of both P-right and P-left. And I'm going to call it JPCLR key. Uh, in other words, jump to a routine called clear key. What I found when I first ran it was... When I pressed P, last key became the value of P, but it stayed as the value of P. So in other words, my counter just zoomed as far right as it could. <laughs> and I, only wanted, I only wanted it to go, when I tapped P, I only wanted it to go one square to the right, but it went all the squares to the right. So clear key is a little routine that I'm going to call so that I clear the value of last key before we jump back to displaying the player. So underneath, we're going to write this little routine. Load last K back into HL and store a zero value in the actual memory location indicated by HL and then jump back to P loop. Simple as that. And that's it. That should enable you to move your character left and right. And next time we'll cover dropping the counter onto the board and changing the player. I don't want to cover it right now because it's pretty complicated. Because remember, it's not just the counter dropping to the bottom. The counter has to know that it lands on any counters that are already there. So we'll leave that to next time. So this covers user input. Um, this is not the only way to to receive input from the user. Uh, this is not the sort of method that you would use in an arcade game, by the way, but this one is a little bit simpler than the method that you would use for arcades. So at least it's a starting point for you. All right, folks, thanks and see you next time.